All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, time to uh, begin. Uh, this uh, lecture is going to be on Austrian capital theory, and it is uh, a very important uh, topic. Uh, it uh, sort of reinforces uh, a number of the uh, principles that was just uh, mentioned by Dr. Newman uh, regarding economic calculation. It is uh, going to play a very large uh, part of understanding the business cycle. And so uh, getting uh, capital theory right is actually uh, of some significance. Um, the, uh, there's a large and vast literature that can be drawn upon uh, to understand uh, capital theory. And uh, I have some uh, the more important uh, titles here. Uh, works uh, by uh, Carl Menger, his Principles of Economics, which you've already heard about uh, this, uh, uh, this week. Uh, Bumbavirk's Positive Theory of Capital is important. Uh, Mises' is Human Action. Uh, Hayek's uh, Prices of Production. Uh, Murray Rothbard's Man Economy and State. Roger Garrison's Time and Money. And Jesus Sweater de Soto's Money, Bank, Credit, and Economic Cycles all uh, have contributed to uh, developing and establishing uh, a uh, sort of a, what should one say, a, a causal realist, a praxeological a capital theory that um, is helpful in understanding um, uh, both the nature of uh, production of a particular good, but then also understanding uh, the workings of the entire social uh, macroeconomy. Um, the first question we can ask ourselves, of course, though, is uh, what is capital? Uh, it can be defined in many ways. Uh, is it just a stock of capital goods? You know, is, it, is the capital of a, a firm uh, the machinery, the tools that are used, the natural resources that they have, the resources they have uh, on hand? Uh, or is it a pot of money for investment, right? Capital is the funds we have, or the funds we use to invest. That's our capital. Um, or, better yet, is it a set of homogenous, non-human factors of production we represent with K? Right? And, 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 it, and of course, if, if, if they're special, we'll call them special K. But uh, uh, the answer is, is none of those uh, completely or, or, or uh, none of those get it quite right by themselves. Uh, certainly the last one is not right at all. Uh, but um, uh, what Mises says is that capital, he defines it very succinctly in human action um, uh, as the sum of the whole complex of goods destined for acquisition evaluated in money terms. That is what uh, capital uh, is. Um, he says that the sum of the whole complex of goods destined for acquisition, that phrase destined for acquisition, means they are goods used for the production and sale of products to acquire income. Right? So firms will use factors of production, land, labor, capital goods, and they'll, they'll use these uh, goods that they can hold and uh, they don't have them just to sort of you know, roll around in and say, oh, look at how many <laughs> capital goods we have. No, they use them to produce other products. And so it's that, that, that set of goods evaluated in money terms, right? So it is, the, it is, it is uh, capital then is a monetary accounting fund that's embodied in capital goods. That's what capital is. And so as such, Capital is that that sum, that sum of the the monetary sum of the monetary value of the capital goods that will be used by a firm. That is the starting point of economic calculation. That's 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 why economic calculation is so important, as you just uh, heard about. It's also important to note then that. Uh, Capital is not merely, again, a merely an amount of money. Mises says, uh, again in Human Action, quote, there is no such thing as an abstract ideal or, quote, capital that exists apart from concrete capital goods. Capital is always embodied in definite capital goods and is affected by everything that happens with regard to them. The value of an amount of capital is a derivative of the value of the capital goods in which it is embodied. Right? And so capital is not just a pot of money in the abstract, but it's also not merely a, a, a set of physical goods. Right? 
So there is a, there's a capital goods aspect to it, a, a capital goods aspect to capital, and then a monetary aspect to capital goods. And so as the, value of cap, as the value of capital goods go, so goes an entrepreneur's capital. So let's talk about capital value in just a, a little bit. Capital value is uh, the capital value of an enterprise, of a firm, is the sum of the monetary value of the assets of the firm minus its liabilities. And the capital value of the asset, we could say, is the sum of the discounted marginal revenue products of a factor over the course of the duration of stability uh, or serviceability of the capital good. Right? So if uh, I am a, uh, uh, a baker and I have an oven that I use as, uh, in, my, in my work, uh, I suspect you may know what's coming. Uh, <laughs> but if I, I'm a baker and I have something and, and I figure, you know, uh, I, 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 my old uh, oven's uh, going kaput and I need to know how much is a new oven worth for me. I have to estimate how long can I use this oven and then how much revenue will be uh, allocated or, or, or uh, how much revenue will I bring in because of my use of this oven and just the oven. If I can separate that out, that would be the marginal revenue product, but that marginal revenue product is going to be earned successfully over, say, a 10-year period. And so uh, the, uh, the, the tenth year's revenue is not going to be valued the same as the first year's revenue because it's 10 years in the future and as we all know as you heard from Dr. Herbner there's people have time preference and so that that future uh, marginal revenue product will be discounted by the interest rate and so each year's marginal revenue product in the future will be discounted by the interest rate over the course of however many years we're talking about if you take all of the sum of the discounted marginal revenue products you can sum that together, and that will be the current value of the asset. That would be equivalent to the uh, maximum price the baker would be willing to pay for the oven. And so therefore, the capital value of an asset, and hence the capital value of the firm, is going to be affected by the productivity of the capital good, right? how good the oven is in actually baking uh, uh, you know, various desserts. Um, uh, also, it's going to be affected by the price of the dessert, right? The price of the product that you're going to be selling. It's also going to be determined uh, and affected by the rate of time preference and the, uh, the rate of interest by which you are discounting the uh, marginal revenue product. And it will be affected by the duration of the serv serviceability, how durable the oven is, right? If you have a really you know, strong, uh, very sturdy uh, uh, oven that lasts for 20 years, that is going to be worth more other things equal than an oven uh, that is going to die in about three years. It's going to give up the ghost of the machine, so to speak. Right. Now, the productivity of a good, the productivity of a capital good itself will be determined by uh, the complementary factors with which they are used. Right? An oven by itself is not going to be very productive right? unless you just, you know, you just get a certain, I don't know, aesthetic pleasure by looking at kitchen appliances. Uh, it's like, oh, that's, you know, that, but that's sort of almost, a cons that's almost like a consumer, uh, uh, it's almost like a consumption uh, factor there. But in terms of uh, an oven being productive and generating revenue, you, you need more than just the oven, right? You need complementary factors, like a little bit of, um, I don't know, uh, semi-sweet chocolate maybe, uh, and, and, and butter and other things, maybe some pastries or what have you. Uh, so you need other complementary factors. You need electricity or, or, or gas to run the oven, right? Without those things, the oven is not worth uh, much in the production process. And so the productivity of the capital good will be determined by the complementary factors with which they are used, and it's also going to be determined by the technology embodied in the capital good, right? The capital good always embodies some given level of technology. Um, if you think about different types of, of, of plows, right? The, the plow that uh, could be pulled behind a couple of oxen, it's fairly primitive. It works, right? It, it, it worked for Pa Ingalls. He was able to plow like that. But I have a friend who's a farmer who doesn't use a plow like that anymore. He has a, 
a plow, a many, a many, uh, a many row plow that pulled behind a tractor. It's a much more advanced technology. Right? And the more modern plow is way more productive than the plow behind the oxen, even though the plow behind the oxen was more productive than just simply, say, a hoe. And then a hoe was more productive than just your hands, right? And so the different technologies uh, uh, in, that embody capital goods will affect how productive the capital good is. Um, now, to get Austrian capital theory right, then, we must see that a capital incorporates both the production structure and entrepreneurial appraisement. It incorporates both the production structure of a good and entrepreneurial uh, appraisement. And fail to recognize either of these can lead us astray. And so we're going to look at both if we have time. And the first thing we're going to look at is the production structure. The production structure is rooted in Carl Manger's, I guess I'm behind this curve here. Uh, uh, the production structure is rooted by Carl Manger's, uh, in a Carl Manger's exposition of the uh, interrelationships of economic goods, which you've already heard about. Right? Um, he talks about the consumer goods, the goods of the lowest order, and they are goods that are directly serviceable. Right? They're directly serviceable. They provide satisfaction directly. You don't need to do anything to it. If I have a, a, a bottle of water, I can just drink the water. I don't have to add anything to the water. It, it refreshes me. That is direct serviceability. That's the consumer good. That's the good of the first order, is what uh, Menger called it. But then there are higher order goods. There are goods related to that. Those are higher order goods. And the higher order goods are goods that we call producer goods as opposed to consumer goods. They are goods that are serviceable, but they are indirectly serviceable. Right? They're serviceable, but indirectly serviceable. Right? If, if the flourless chocolate cake is a consumer <laughs> it's a if the flourless chocolate cake is a consumer good, then the eggs are the higher order good, right? The higher the eggs, the raw eggs are not consumed, they're not consumed directly for their satisfaction. Uh, but they are serviceable in making the flourless chocolate cake, which is the consumer good. Right? And so they are transformed, the, the, the capital goods, the higher order goods, I should say, are transformed into directly serviceable goods only at some point in the future. And if we look at the different types of uh, higher order goods, there are three basic categories. There's land, there's labor, and there's capital goods. And land and labor, as uh, you may know, are considered original factors of production because all of the goods that we have began by mixing land and labor. Right? Land and labor were the two original factors that, 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 that we had um, at the very beginning. And then land and labor was mixed together to create the third category, the capital good. The capital good is a produced means of production. That's the definition of a capital good. It's a produced means of production. Right? You don't have to produce labor. Right? If I want to make a flourless chocolate cake, I don't first have to say, wait a minute, let me spend about oh, 45 minutes you know, manufacturing my labor, and then I can use it to make the flourless chocolate cake. No, I have the labor with me. right? And so I just use it. Right? But I can't just use chocolate that doesn't exist. I can't use eggs that don't exist. I can't use butter that don't exist. They have to be produced first. I can't use an oven that doesn't exist. It has to be produced first. And so capital goods are the produced means of production. And we use them then, uh, along with land and labor, the original factors, to produce a product. Now, each consumer good is made possible because of its structure of production. Uh, and here we have, uh, as I like to maintain, the greatest dessert in the history of human civilization, uh, the flourless chocolate cake. It's the only, that dessert is so good, it is the only dessert that we know of that is named for an ingredient it does not possess. <laughs> it, it, would make, it would not make any sense to call it a flourless chocolate cake if it had flour, right? I, I just find that interesting. Well, anyway, to make uh, the flourless chocolate cake, the producer must obtain services of the necessary land, labor, and uh, capital goods. And these are examples here. It's not the whole ball of wax, but here's examples. Some uh, semi-sweet chocolate, uh, a, a pound, by the way, uh, uh, a half pound of butter, eight eggs, uh, a stand-up mixer, 
uh, a spring form pan, a, an oven. There are other things too. Oh, and this, this I, I love this, this is a pastry chef on clear on, I guess be your left, um, is a photo by August uh, Sand, who uh, is a, or Sand or Sander, I can't remember. Anyway, he uh, was a German photographer that went uh, throughout uh, Germany taking photos in the 1920s of sort of just people in their occupations. And here we have this pastry chef who had just like just giant hands. I mean, this guy has this guy has beat a few eggs in his day. Just let me tell you. And so, and that's what we need. Uh, we want to make a flourless chocolate cake, right? And so that is um, that's what's necessary, right? But notice, before we can eat the flourless chocolate cake, the, before we can produce the flourless chocolate cake, the chocolate, the butter, the eggs, the mixer itself must first be produced. So the producer must obtain factors of production by purchasing them in exchange for money, right, in a monet modern monetary economy. And here we have a, a more exhaustive and yet simplistic uh, structure of production for a, a flourless chocolate cake. Um, to get the flourless chocolate cake, we need land and labor, semi-sweet chocolate, butter, eggs. We need electricity. We need an oven. We need a microwave oven. We need a spring form pan. We need a mixer. We need a bowl. We need a spatula. We need all of these things. Right? And where are we going to get the uh, oven, the microwave oven, the spring form pan, the mixer, the bowl, the spatula? Well, from the kitchen supply shop which is a higher stage. In the kitchen supply shop, we can get um, those things, but only if the investor, the producer, uh, the, the shopkeeper has purchased or rented a shop, a building. And then accumulated things like mixers and ovens and pans and bowls and spatulas and office equipment and electricity and land and labor that can be used then to have a retail, well, a, a sort of a, a, a wholesale supplier of these kitchen uh, supplies. If we want, um, if we want uh, butter, we need raw milk, salt, a separator, tanks. A, 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 a churner of some sort, packaging, a dairy plant. We need electricity, transport, land, and labor. Uh, to get eggs, you need a chicken, chicken feed, a chicken coop. Right. Water, automated equipment, packaging, electricity, uh, factory transport, land and labor, et cetera, et cetera. So for each of these uh, capital goods, the semi-sweet chocolate, the eggs, the butter, uh, the electricity, the oven, the microwave oven, et cetera, et cetera, there is an even higher stage in which these goods are produced. And so if we wanted to make um, the mixer, how does the mi the, where does the mixer come from? The mixer requires uh, zinc castings, metal parts, machines, paint, tools, electronic parts, because it's an electronic uh, appliance. Uh, it requires... Um, a factory where all these things are put together, and then it requires packaging, land, and labor. So there's an even higher stage above the mixing stage, right? Well, then, of course, even at a higher stage, and this is where it gets a little fuzzy because, you know, there's only one slide, and that's even too small, really. Uh, the highest stage, you have mining and farming and refining, which produces a whole host of these different types of um, uh, even higher order capital goods. Right? To make a zinc casting, you have to have zinc, for instance. Right? Um, in order to have uh, chickens to produce eggs, you have to have a place where you can reproduce chickens. Right? And so, I mean, like, and I'm talking about real chickens. I'm not talking about impossible chicken. You know, I'm talking about <laughs> fake chickens. Right? I'm talking about like real chickens that, that that lay real eggs that you can actually use to make a real flourless chocolate cake. Anyway. Um, so at each of these stages, and this is what's important here, each of these stages, the producer obtains the services of the factor of production by purchasing them in exchange for money. And when the production of the lower order good is completed, the producer sells it for money. Right? And so the egg producer spends money investing in chicken and chicken feed, et cetera, and produces these eggs, and then they sell the eggs to the baker who's going to make, use the eggs to make a flourless chocolate cake. The, the, the baker of the flourless chocolate cake spends money buying some sweet chocolate, eggs, and butter, and then makes the greatest dessert in the world, and then sells it in the bake shop or in the dessert shop. We'll just call it just desserts. And they'll sell it in the dessert shop for money. Right. And the process continues 
from the, from the highest stages down to the lowest stages until the consumer good is made by the lowest order producer, and he sells it in exchange for money to the ultimate consumer. And so um, there are a, a couple of important fundamental principles uh, that you've already heard about, but I'm just sort of reviewing here. And uh, one of these uh, principles is that production effort moves down the structure of production. Production effort, and this is again, this is just directionally, it's not a magnitude, but the production effort begins at the top highest stages, right? You don't, you don't produce the, um, uh, the flourless chocolate cake first and then produce the butter, right? And you don't produce the butter first and then produce the raw cream that you use to make the butter. No, you have to have the cream first before you have to, so you have to engage, somebody has to engage in producing cream first before somebody can take that cream and put a production effort into producing the butter, and then only after the butter is made can someone produce the flourless chocolate cake. So production effort begins at the highest stages and directionally moves down the structure of production from the highest stage to the lowest stage. Um, at the same time, value, and in, value is imputed up the structure of production meaning the chocolate and the butter and the eggs and the mixer and the spring form pan and the spatula and the electricity, et cetera, are valued because they can be used in making the flourless chocolate cake, which is valued. Right? If people didn't value the flourless chocolate cake, they would have less reason to value the eggs, the butter, the, the um, uh, the, the semi-sweet chocolate, the spatulas, the spring form pans, et cetera. It's not as if you know, the demand for semi-sweet chocolate would go away if, if people took leave of their senses and decided they didn't want any more flourless chocolate cake. Um, however, the, the, the value would be less because these, higher order, these other goods would not be valued as much. And so value is imputed up the structure of production. Um, at the same time, income moves up the structure of production. Producers use money that they own to purchase the services of higher stage factors of production. And so the baker of the flourless chocolate cake pays money that becomes income to the producer of a higher stage capital good. And so the and then the say the, uh, the, the 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 butter producer takes the savings that he has and invests it in the cream and in the churn, et cetera, and that becomes income for the people that own uh, the churn and own the cream, et cetera. Right? And so in monetary income moves up the structure of production as value does, where production effort moves down. Now, those producers who use their money to invest in the purchase of factors of production, what do we call them? They're called the capitalists, right? The capitalists. Um, and if, you know, if they have hygiene problems, we call them the dirty capitalists. Right? Uh, capitalists are those who produce and own various stages of capital goods as a result of their saving and investing. And we've already seen that any act of production takes time and hence is based on speculation, speculation about the future state of the market. Structure production is, in some sense, the other side of the division of labor coin, meaning the structure production also must be coordinated by entrepreneurial judgment. Each producer, like the egg producer, must produce eggs in anticipation that he could sell his eggs for a profit. The semi-sweet chocolate producer produces a semi-sweet chocolate in anticipation based on a forecast that he can sell his chocolate for a profit. So any investment in production is made only in anticipation of a later sale to lower order producers and finally, at the retail stage, to consumers. Now, it's my, by the way, uh, it's not easy. If you look at just, just to think about making one little flourless chocolate cake. It requires all of this production activity to go on somewhere, sometime. Um, that, by the, immediately should sort of give us pause to consider whether or not we could centrally plan something like this. Right? I, I think every, every uh, politician, every 
sociologist, every economist who wants to call for central planning should at least just one time in their life try to fully think out the production structure required to produce just one good, not every good, but just one good, and ask themselves how easy would it be to centrally plan this effectively. Um, I think that would, that would, if people were honest with themselves, that would save us a lot of trouble. But uh, in any event, the complex production uh, structure is made possible only by the use of capital goods. And using capital goods, as we have seen, requires longer production processes. By longer production process, it means we have to wait before we get certain consumer goods. We have to be willing to lengthen the entire production process to get more of what we want, what we really, really want, I guess. It would be sort of the zig zig ah so to speak. I'm not even sure what that is. But um, in this con that means we have to save, right? If, if, if Groucho, the baker, wants to obtain a standing mixer because that's going to help him make a flourless chocolate cake, he must be willing to put $500 towards this mixer. Well, how can he do that? Only if he restrains from spending $500 on himself in consumption, right? He must forego, in other words, maybe this ping pong table. He really likes ping pong. Ping pong's where it's at. Ping pong is hip. Ping pong has a beach you can dance to. And he really likes ping pong, but he likes uh, larger incomes in the future even more, right? So he's gonna be willing to restrict his spending on this consumer good, this ping pong table of $500, so he can direct, take those $500 and direct that and invest that in accumulating a stand-up mixer. So he must forego spending the $500 on the ping pong table, and he can use the mixer to aid in future production only by sacrificing consumption now, which is the fun from playing ping pong. And so what do we call this restriction of consumption? Restriction of consumption is called saving. And the transfer of saved resources to the accumulation of capital goods is called investment. So accumulating capital goods that allows us to engage in production requires saving and investment. We cannot invest without saving. Somebody has to save in order to invest. And people do that because capital goods are very beneficial to the production process. The capital goods increase because they increase our productivity. We can produce uh, more goods if we have capital goods. And, and capital goods increase our product productivity. Capital goods increase our productivity in two ways. Uh, one, capital goods, the use of capital goods increases the productivity in tasks we can do without capital goods, right? As I said, it's possible, it is possible to beat eight eggs by hand with just your fingers. I've tried it. Um, <laughs> I will tell you also, it is a whole lot more productive to use a mixer, right? It's more productive to use a whisk, and it's even more productive to use a handheld mixer, and it's even more productive to use a standing mixer, right? And so capital goods uh, allow us to produce more output uh, than we can of some goods without the use of capital goods. Right? But secondly and most importantly, capital goods allow us to produce goods we otherwise could not obtain at all. Right? This is one of my uh, favorite cartoons. Um, I can't remember even now the name of the, the comic strip, but uh, if you can see the caption there, uh, before the hook, the pole, and the worm uh, were even thought of, there existed a time known to fish as the golden age, right? <laughs> uh, where people were left trying to fish with just their bare hands, right? They didn't have these capital goods. So, I mean, the, the whole idea, of course, is be almost uh, impossible to, to live off fish if you didn't have certain capital goods. That's the point. If you think about a lot of the consumer goods that we, the goods that we have that we feel are, are necessary, right, are our, our, our smarty phones, uh, even our dumb phones, actually, um, our, our eyeglasses, uh, automobiles, would be impossible to have without capital goods. And so there's a whole host of goods that we just take for granted that we just would not have if there, we didn't have capital goods. And so using capital goods um, allows people to be more productive in the sense that they can produce more goods or produce certain goods that they otherwise would not be able to produce at all. And so uh, taking these two 
uh, types of increased productivity together, we find that the role of capital goods is to advance people in time toward the objective of producing a consumer good. That's what uh, capital goods do. They, they allow us to, produce, to, to reach our end sooner than later. Now, capital goods are so good, right? why don't we do nothing but save and invest? Right? What keeps people from investing more and more resources in capital goods? Time preference, right? time preference, time preference for present goods. At some point, people will value the present good more than the same amount of goods in the future. No matter how low your time preference is, you got to eat. Right? So at some point, people are going to say, you know what, uh, I've saved enough, I put off consumption enough, I'm going to consume now, I am going to satisfy myself with the present good as opposed to saving uh, for more in the future. And so the, uh, the intensity by which we prefer present goods to future good is called time prep. Or, well, the, 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 the fact that we value present goods um, more highly than future goods is time preference. Different people have different intensities of time preference, right? Some people are very present oriented. Right? Uh, they uh, find it hard saving it all. Right? I, know, I, I, I know people like that very intimately. Uh, there might be people in my own family, I'm not going to name any names, but say have issues with uh, saving. Um, and at the same time, I other, uh, have other family members that are seeming much more uh, at ease with saving and uh, you know, investing in, in the future. And so different people have different time preferences. Um, and those people that, we, that, that are very present oriented, often referred to as very high time preference people, they will tend to save uh, less and then have fewer uh, uh, capital goods with which to use. They'll tend to be on a lower income trajectory over time. Um, on the other hand, those people that have a lower time preference and are more willing to put off present consumption, more willing to save and invest, will tend to accumulate capital of some sort over time and tend to be more productive and tend to, uh, tend, tend to be winners, right? Uh, tend to be more productive and hence uh, have a higher uh, levels of, of income. Now, what this means is that um, the uh, uh, amount of uh, capital that one accumulates and the type of capital goods that one accumulates are dependent on the person, right? Uh, they are dependent by actions. They, no, there, there's, capitalists are not automatons, they're not robots, right? Um, uh, they, are, uh, they are humans that make decisions based on their subjective preferences and their uh, entrepreneurial judgments. And uh, that incorporates, uh, their, their, their preferences incorporates their time preference. Right? And so uh, people can make different choices about what kind of capital goods uh, uh, to accumulate. For instance, um, they can arrange production in a more or less capital intensive process. Right? We want to, again, make a flyless chocolate cake. We could, we could beat the eggs with just a fork. Right? If we want to actually use a capital, we don't use our fingers, well, let's use a fork, right? the, like the most simple capital good we could use in the kitchen. Or we could use a handheld whisk. Right? Or we could use a handheld mixer. Or we could use a stand-up mixer. A stand-up mixer is a great thing because that almost like doubles your productivity. Because right? you put the eight eggs in the, the, the bowl and turn it on, and that thing starts, you know, doing its thing in the mixing, and, and then you're over here, after you've cut up the semi-sweet chocolate, a pound of semi-sweet chocolate, and then the half pound of butter that you've cut up, and you put it in the microwave oven, you're doing that, and you're basically doing the work of two people, right? Because the stand-up mixer is increasing your productivity so much. That's how great the, the, the stand-up mixer is. And so, and I'm not getting any money for that, I'm just, I'm just stating facts. I'm just here speaking the truth, that's what we do here. And so, uh, so um, you can have that. Now, of course, if you wanted to like, have a really big bakery operation, you could use this, uh, this, this mixer clear on the right, which is like an, the industrial strength mixer. I used that once to help uh, for a fundraising project mixing a funnel cake batter. Those things are huge. It was, it was just amazing, amazing uh, pieces of capital goods. But the point is, the production process can be more or less capital intensive, and that's going to be a decision made by the, the entrepreneur, made by the entrepreneur. Um, and uh, which producer 
uh, w w which level of capital uh, I intensity uh, the uh, producer uses depends on his preferences. And so uh, capital intensity becomes a choice variable. Another choice variable is the specificity of the capital goods. Each factor of production has a different degree of specificity. Right? If you think of eggs versus stream, stream, uh, spring form pans, th these are things you could invest in. A spring form pan is going to be more specific in terms of its uses, what it can be used for, than eggs. Right? I mean, eggs, it, eggs, you can use eggs to make uh, a flourless chocolate cake. You can make eggs to make a flour full chocolate cake. You can use eggs to make a white cake. You can use eggs to make a cheese cake. You can use eggs to make an omelet. You can use eggs to make a pancake. You can use eggs to make chocolate chip cookies. You can use eggs to make uh, oatmeal raisin cookies. Um, you can, you can, if, you know, Rocky Balboa used raw eggs to make some type of breakfast drink that was supposed to help him beat Apollo Creed, which it did, it turns out, in the second film. Anyway, uh, so my point is eggs has a, a lot of uses. Now, the springform pan has more than one use, too. You use a springform pan to make a flourless chocolate cake. You can use a springform pan to make a cheesecake. Or you can make a springform pan to make... Um, well, you get the idea. Uh, there's more uses for eggs than there is for a spring form pan. So a spring form pan is more specific. Now, what that means is, let's suppose that the, uh, let's suppose that the, the, the dessert business side goes belly up. The spring form pan is used almost exclusively for desserts. That spring form pan pretty much loses almost its entire value. Where eggs, if you have eggs, you could use eggs to you know, make a variety of breakfast options, for instance. And so the degree of specificity is, is, is again, a, uh, an important thing for uh, producers to consider. So it's a choice variable. Um, if we're going to make, if we're going to, if we're going to invest in making desserts, do we want semi-sweet dark chocolate or do we want milk chocolate, right? That's going to impact, um, again, the type of production we can engage in. And so each factor has a different degree of specificity. How specific, how many specific uses the capital good has, so that becomes a choice factor. Another factor that must be taken into account is durability, right? Um, all capital goods are perishable. Perishable. They don't last forever. They're not like, you know, they say diamonds are forever. I'm not even sure if that's true, but certainly spatulas are not forever. And I can attest to this, right? And I can attest to that spatula on, the, on your left is not nearly as durable as those spatulas on, on your right. I've had both, and I've went through several of those cheap, flimsy things. Usually they get loose and the end comes flying off. And if you're, if you're like going really, you know, if you're really spatuling something very aggressively, <laughs> it can become somewhat dangerous, right? And, and so it doesn't very durable, which means you're not going to want to put a lot of money into that type of spatula versus these others, which are you know, sort of uh, uh, much more durable, much more hardy. Uh, they, don't come flying, they, they don't come flying off. They, they won't last forever, right? They wear out. They will wear some too. But, but simply the point is, because all capital goods are perishable, they each have a rate at which they're used up, which we call depreciation. And each particular capital gets at a different rate of, that they're used up. The, the, the white spatula there, is smaller, uh, uh, higher rate of depreciation compared to the uh, red spatulas on, on, on the right there. Um, at the same time, you think about uh, you know, certain capital goods, such as eggs. Eggs are used up immediately when they're used, right? You put the egg in the bowl, to start beating it, to put it in the flourless chocolate cake, you can't. Once it's in, the, it's in flourless chocolate cake, you can't wait. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, I believe in recycling. I'm going to extract those eggs and use them for an omelet now. Right? You can't do that, right? It's used up. Just boom. The minute it's in there, it's gone. It's like uh, at the nanosecond it's in the bowl, it's used up. Whereas, say, the oven that you're using to bake the flourless chocolate cake could be there for 15, 20 years, right? So different capital goods have different uh, rates of uh, durations of serviceability. They have different rates of depreciation. But the key point here, after the capital good is used up, we're back to where we started. And so to maintain productivity over time, if we achieve a certain level of productivity with the stand-up mixer, to maintain that productivity over time, we need to save up enough over time so that we can replace the stand-up mixer when it 
goes kerplunk kerplui, right? when it dies. Right? And so in order to, uh, so, so every day that the producer or the capitalist is engaging in uh, business, he has the option of either accumulating capital, maintaining capital, or consuming capital. Maintaining capital simply means we're keeping the same quantity of capital goods steady over time. Right? So uh, the day that one spatula wears out, we have another spatula to take its place. Right? On the other hand, accumulating capital would be equivalent to uh, say, uh, having one stand-up mixer and wanting to expand operations, so we uh, buy another, we invest in another stand-up mixer. Right? And so the quantity, the magnitude of our capital gets increases, and hence the, the, the monetary value of our assets increase as well. Both of those require adequate savings. Right? Both of those require saving, restricting consumption first so that we have income that we can direct towards investment. So we can either maintain or accumulate capital goods. Now the good news for those of us who like to consume capital, we don't have to do anything really. We just, do we don't have to save. You know, you have a, you have a stand up mixer, I just use it until it dies. Um, I've got some butter, I've got a certain, I'm, I'm invested in maybe, I don't know, five pounds of butter. I get done with, I get done with using my five pounds of butter. I don't save, so I don't have any money left. Uh, I've lived high on the dessert hog. Uh, for a while, but it was, it was good while it lasted, but then um, those capital goods are consumed, uh, so we're, we're back, to, we're back to, to square one, right? Which, which is, is actually also helpful here to, to sort of contemplate. What this means is, in order to uh, increase our standard of living by making us more productive, we need to accumulate capital, which requires initial saving and investment. In order to maintain that higher standard of living that we get from higher productivity that's made possible by the use of capital goods, we must continue to save at a rate sufficient that we're able to replace used capital goods when they wear out. If we do not do that, however, if we do not save enough, if our time preference is higher than that which allows us to save and invest to maintain capital, we will consume capital. And as the old capital goods wear out, we will not replace them. And so the quantity of capital goods that we have at our uh, disposal will be less. The sum of the monetary value of those assets will be less. Our capital will shrink, and therefore we will be less productive and our standard of living will fall. And so our level of productivity and standard of living is closely connected to our uh, magnitude of capital that we have to use, which is closely and ultimately determined on our time preference, right? on our time preference. And this understanding of the capital structure that we've described it um, has significant implications for macroeconomics. If we look at modern macroeconomics versus Austrian economics, uh, I have two representation of modern macro, sort of a Keynesian variety and neoclassical variety of modern macro. And the Keynesian variety, has sort of uh, coming out of the, 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 the mind of John Maynard Keynes, conceives of uh, or models the economy as uh, an accounting identity where Y is national income, or, which is equal to the value of national output, and uh, Y, national income, is the sum of C plus I plus G plus NX, right? The total amount of uh, consumer spending plus uh, business investment spending plus government spending plus spending on net exports, right? And all of this spending then is uh, why? And so all of the capital structure in Keynesian economics is not a capital structure. It's all subsumed in this homogeneous I, uh, the big I for investment. And that's all really that Keynesians have to say about the nature of capital. It can be more or less, but that's it. Right? Well, similarly, if you look at the neoclassical construction, the neoclassical uh, macroeconomics is built on the idea that we can model the entire uh, the entire macroeconomy 
with one giant short run production function. And so capital really is that, that K there, that KT. T means T for time period. So K is just a homogeneous blob of uh, capital. And so in both forms of modern macroeconomics, we have a significant aggregation issue. And the aggregation of assuming all of the capital structure in, in I or all in K obscures all of the insights that we know from the Austrian structure production. We know that the Austrian structure production conceives of the capital structure. It's not just an amount. It's a structure of heterogeneous capital goods with different uses, different degrees of specificity, and different degrees of durability. And those capital goods must be used in the right place, at the right time, in the right combination, with other complementary factors to be productive. Which means we have to have um, a, a, a society that allows for entrepreneurial activity and entrepreneurial judgment to direct these capital goods to their most highly valued uses, which requires economic calculation, which you just heard of in the previous lecture. Um, if we don't have that, if we don't have a society that allows for free market prices, entrepreneurial judgment to be manifested in the free actions of the entrepreneurs, uh, we will be left with a, well, if we have an economy, it will be less efficient uh, than uh, it would be in a free society because we don't have entrepreneurs that can allocate the different capital investments to the right place in the production structure at the right time. The capital will be wasted. Capital, the, the, the stock of capital will shrink over time. Our productivity will fall. And we will be relatively impoverished, which is not really the goal of economic activity. And I'm a little over time, so we'll stop here. Thank you for your attention.